Liddy by Katherine Patterson. Chapter 1 The Bear. The bear had been their undoing, though at the time they had all laughed. No, Mama had never laughed, but Liddy and Charles and the babies had laughed until their bellies ached. Liddy still thought of them as the babies. She probably always would. Agnes had been four and Rachel six that November of 1843, the year of the bear. It had been Charles's fault if fault there was. He had fetched in wood from the shed and left the door ajar, but the door had not shut tight for some time, so perhaps he'd shut it as best he could. Who knows? At any rate, Liddy looked up from the pot of oatmeal she was stirring over the fire, and there in the doorway was a massive black head, the nose up and smelling, the tiny eyes bright with hungry anticipation. Don't nobody yell, she said softly. Just back up slow and quiet to the ladder and climb up to the loft. Charlie, you get Agnes, and Mama, you take Rachel. She heard her mother whimper, shh, she continued, her voice absolutely even. It's all right, long as nobody gets upset. Just take it nice and gentle, eh? I'm watching him all the way, and I'll yank the ladder up after me. They obeyed her, even Mama, though Liddy could hear her sucking in her breath. Behind Liddy's back, the ladder creaked as two by two, first Charles and Agnes, then Mama and Rachel, climbed up into the loft. Liddy glared straight into the bear's eyes, daring him to step forward into the cabin. Then, when the ladder was silent and she could hear the slight rustling above her as the family settled themselves on the straw mattresses, she backed up to the ladder and, never taking her eyes off the bear, inched her way up to the loft. At the top, she almost fell backward onto the platform. Charles dragged her onto the mattress beside her mother. The racket released the bear from the charm Liddy seemed to have placed on him. He banged the door aside and rushed in toward the ladder, but Charles snatched it. The bottom rung swung out, hitting the beast in the nose. The blow startled him momentarily, giving Liddy a chance to help Charles haul the ladder up onto the platform and out of reach. The old bear roared in frustration and waved at the empty air with his huge paws, then reared up on his hind legs. He was so tall that his nose nearly touched the edge of the loft. The little girls cried out. Their mother screamed, Oh Lord, deliver us. Hush, Liddy commanded. You'll just make him madder. The cries were swallowed up in anxious gasps of breath. Charles's arms went around the little ones and Liddy put a firm grip on her mother's shoulder. It was trembling, so Liddy relaxed her fingers and began to stroke. It's all right, she murmured. He can't reach us. But could he climb the supports? It didn't seem likely. Could he, in his frustration, take a mighty leap and... No, she tried to breathe deeply and evenly and keep her eyes fixed on those of the beast. He fell to all fours, and tossing his head, broke off from her gaze as though embarrassed. He began to explore the cabin. He was hungry, obviously, and looking for the source of the smell that had drawn him in. He knocked over the churning jug and licked tentatively at the blade, but Liddy had cleaned it too well after churning that morning, and the critter soon gave up trying to find nourishment in the wood. Before he found the great pot of oatmeal in the kettle over the fire, he had turned over the table and the benches and upended the spinning wheel. Liddy held her breath, praying that he wouldn't break anything. Charles and she would try to mend, but he was only ten and she thirteen. They hadn't their father's skill or experience. Don't break nothing, she begged silently. They couldn't afford to replace any of the household goods. Next, the beast knocked over a jar of apple butter, but the skin lid was tied on tightly and flail away at it as he might with his awkward paw, he could not dislodge it. He smacked it across the floor where it hit the overturned bench, but, thank the Lord, the heavy pottery did not shatter. At last he came to the oatmeal, bubbling, by the smell of it scorching, over the fire. He thrust his head deep into the kettle and howled with pain as his nose met the boiling porridge. He threw back his head, but in doing so jerked the kettle off the hook, and when he turned he was wearing it over his head like a black pumpkin. The bear was too stunned, it seemed, simply to lower his neck and let the kettle fall off. He danced about the room in pain on four, then two legs, the kettle covering his head, the boiling oatmeal raining down his thick neck and coat. He knocked about, searching for the way out, but when he found the open door, managed to push it shut. Battering the door with his kettle-covered head, he tore it off its leather hinges and loped out into the dark. For a long time, they could hear him crashing through the bush until, at last, the November night gathered about them once more with its accustomed quiet. Then they began to laugh. Rachel first, throwing back her dark curls and showing the spaces where her pretty little teeth had been only last summer. Then Agnes joined in with her shrill four-year-old shout and next Charles's not yet manly giggle. Whew, Liddy said. Lucky I'm so ugly. A pretty girl couldn't have scared that old rascal. You ain't ugly, Rachel cried. 
But they laughed louder than ever, Liddy the loudest of all, until the tears of laughter and relief ran down her thin cheeks and her belly cramped and doubled over. When did she laugh so much? She could not remember. Her mother's shoulders were shaking, but Liddy couldn't see her face. Mama must be laughing too. Liddy dared to hope that her mother might laugh. Oh, there was the door to mend and the mess to be cleaned up and the wasted porridge. But tomorrow she and Charles would find the kettle. The bear couldn't have taken it far, and he was sure to have left more than an adequate trail with all that crashing through the underbrush. Let her be laughing, she prayed. Mama, she whispered, leaning her mouth close to her mother's ear. You all right, eh? Her mother whirled toward her. It's the sign, she said. What sign, Mama? Liddy asked, though she did not want an answer. Clarissa said when the end drew near, the devil would walk the earth. That weren't no devil, Mama, Charles said. It were only a black bear. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Aunt Clarissa don't know, Mama, Liddy said, as firmly as she could, though a shudder went through her body. It were only a black bear, Rachel's anxious little voice echoed her brother's. And then, weren't it, Liddy? Weren't it a bear? Liddy nodded, so as not to seem to be contradicting their mother out loud. "'Tomorrow we're going to Pulteney,' their mother said. "'I aim to be with the faithful when the end comes.' "'I don't want to be with the faithful,' Rachel said. "'I want to be with Liddy.' "'Liddy will come too,' their mother said. "'But how will Papa find us if we've left home?' Charles asked. "'Your father went out searching for vain riches. "'He ain't never coming back.' "'He will, he will,' Rachel cried. "'He promised.' "'Though how could she remember? "'She'd been barely three when he'd left.' It was hard for the babies to go to sleep. Their stomachs were empty since the porridge had been ruined, and Mama would not hear a fix and more. Charles helped Liddy clean the cabin. They propped up the door and put the chest against it to keep it in place until they could fix it in the morning. Then he climbed up the ladder to bed. Liddy stayed below. The fire must be banked for the night. She knelt down on the hearth. Behind her left shoulder sat Mama in the one chair, a rocker she had brought from Pulteney when she came as a bride. Liddy stole a glance at her. She was rocking like one dazed, staring unblinking into the fire. The truth be told, Mama had gone somewhat queer in the head after their father had left. Liddy had to acknowledge it. Not so strange as her sister Clarissa, and her end-of-the-world shouting husband Judah, surely not. But now the bear seemed to have pushed her too far. "'Don't let's go, Mama,' Liddy pleaded softly. "'Please, Mama.' But her Mama only stared at the fireplace, rocking slowly back and forth, her eyes blank and still as though her spirit had gone away and left the body there, rocking on and on. It was useless to argue, and Liddy gave up, hoping that the mood would pass, like her mother's times of craziness always had. But the next morning, her mother had not forgotten her determination. "'If it ain't Clarissa's, it'll soon be the poor farm,' she said. The only charity Liddy dreaded more than Aunt Clarissa's was that of the township's poor farm. It was to escape that specter that their father had headed west. "'I can't stop you to go,' Liddy said. "'But I can't go with you. I can't leave the farm.' When her mother opened her mouth to argue, Liddy went on. "'The sow won't fetch enough to provide coach fare for the lot of us.' She sent Charles along to make sure her mother and the babies arrived safely at Uncle Judah's farm. Charlie was a funny sight, hardly higher than a currant bush, but drawn up like a man in his worn boots and his father's old woolen shirt with the sleeves rolled. He loaded up the barrow. They'd sold the horse cart for seeds last year. It's only ten miles to Cutler's where the coach stops. The little ones can ride when they get too tired, he said. He put in their mother's old skin trunk, which had carried her meager trousseau to the, this mountain, and most of the food she'd managed to preserve before she gave up trying. Between them, he and Liddy wrestled the old sow to the ground and tied her, squealing to a shaft of the barrow. "'You want I should go with you as far as the village?' she asked him, but they agreed it would be better for her to tend the cow and horse and protect the house from the wild critters. "'You watch out for yourself,' he said anxiously. "'I'll do fine,' she said. "'Now remember, you got to get enough for the pig to pay coach fare for everyone, and for me to come back again,' he said, as a promise that she would not be left alone on the mountain farm. He glanced about to make sure his mother wasn't in hearing distance. You mustn't be afraid to go down and ask the Quaker Stevens for help, Liddy. They mean to be good neighbors to us no matter what Mama says. Well, I'll see how it goes, eh? She said, tossing her thin plates behind her shoulders. He should know she was not going to be beholden to the neighbors for anything so trivial as her own comfort. Their mother didn't approve of heathens or abolitionists, and since she considered their Quaker neighbors a bit of both, she forbade the children to have anything to do with the Stevenses. Ain't no war then gonna have truck with the devil, she said. Early last summer, when Mama was having one of her spells and not paying much attention, Charlie had again sneaked the cow down the mountain to the Stevenson's place. As long as Liddy could remember, long before their father had left, they had made use of the Stevenson's 
people. If their mother ever wondered about those calves that were born like miracles every spring, she never mentioned it. She knew as well as Lydia and Charles that they could never have managed without the cash money those calves brought in. Lydia didn't care one way or the other about the neighbor's radical ideas and peculiar ways. She minded mightily being beholden. It couldn't be helped. The use of a bull was a necessity she couldn't manage on her own, but she would starve to death rather than go begging before this year's calf was safely born and it was time to mate the cow once more. She needn't have worried. Charlie came back in about two weeks and together they made it through the winter. They shot rabbits and peeled bark for soup to eke out their scarce provisions. They ran out of flour for bread so the churn stood idle, but I never craved churning, said Liddy. When the time for the calving drew near, they reluctantly let the cow go dry. They had no need for butter without any bread but they'd miss the milk and cheese sorely nonetheless they were farmers enough to do what was best for their only cow the calf was born to great rejoicing and a new abundance of milk and cream Lydia and charles felt rich as townsfolk a sweet little heifer she was arriving on the first warm day of march the same day that they bored holes in the sugar maples and inserted the spills that they had made to catch the sap flow they were able to make enough syrup and sugar for themselves hardly enough for a cash crop but they were learning and in another year after another harvest they would be experienced old farmers and sugarers they told each other years later she would remember that morning the late may sky was brilliant to dare you to wink blue and the cheek of the hillside wore a three-day growth of green high in one of the apple trees a bluebird warbled his full spring song shara we ra we it cheerily cheerily Liddy's own spirit rose in reply. Her rough hands were stretched to grasp the satin smooth wooden shafts of the old plow. With Charles at the horse's head, they urged and pushed the heavy metal blade through the rocky earth. The plow cast up the clean, damp smell of new turned soil. Cheerily, cheerily. Then, into that perfect spring morning, a horse and rider had come round the narrow curve of the road, slowly, the horse gingerly picking its way across the deep, dried ruts of mud left from the thaws of April and early May. Charlie, she said quietly, hardly daring to move, because for a moment she hoped it might be Papa, but only for a moment. It was plainly a woman riding side saddle, and not their mother either. She never rode since she fell years ago and miscarried the baby that would have come between Liddy and Charles. Charlie, Liddy repeated, someone's coming. Miss Peck, for she was the writer, had brought a letter from the general store in the village. I thought you might be wanting this, she said. Liddy fetched the coins for the postage from their almost empty cash box. The shopkeeper's wife waited a bit, hoping perhaps that Liddy would read the letter aloud, but she didn't. Liddy was not much of a reader, so it was later. The short wisps of hair around her face plastered with sweat that she held the letter close to the fire and managed to make out the words in her mother's cramped and painfully childish hand. Dear Liddy, the world have not come to the end yet but we can still hope. Meantime, I've hired you out to M. Cutler at the tavern and for your brother to Baker's Mill. The pasture fields and sugar bush is lent to M. Westcott to repay debts, also cow and horse. L leave at once you get this. Your loving mother, Maddie M. Worthen. Liddy burst into tears. I'm sorry, Charlie, she said to her brother's amazed and anxious face. I never expected this. We were doing so good, eh? You and me? He took a deep breath, reached into his pocket, and handed her a ragged kerchief. It's all right, Liddy, he said. It's all right. When she kept her tear-streaked face buried in his kerchief, he gave one of her braids a tweak. The world have not come to the end yet, eh? He took the letter from her lap, and when she wiped her face and tried to smile, he grinned anxiously and pointed to their mother's primitive spelling. See, we can still hope. Liddy laughed uncertainly. Her spelling was no better than their mother's, so she did not really see the joke at first. But Charlie laughed, and so she began to laugh, though it was the kind of laughter that caught like briars in her chest and felt very much like pain. Chapter 2 Kindly Friends She didn't say nothing about the calf, Liddy said suddenly in the midst of their sorrowful packing up. She got no cause to, Charles said. We never tell her about it. You know, Charlie, that calf is rightfully ours. He looked at her, his honest head cocked, his eyes dubious. No, truly, we was the ones asked Quaker Stevens to lend us use of his bull. Mama didn't have nothing to do with it. But if they's debts, she's letting out the fields and the horse and cow. She's sending you to be a miller's boy and me to housemaid. She's got us body and soul. We got no call to give her the calf. She set one hand on her waist and strengthened her aching back. What do you aim to do with it? Hush, I'm studying on it. Obediently, he quieted and stared in the same direction at the spindly maples that made up their stand of sugar bush. It's a nice fat heifer, she said. We kept it so long on its mother's milk. We'll get a good price for it. We'd be bound to give the money to her. 
No, her wit voice was sharper than she meant, ground as it was on three years of unspoken anger. We always done that, and look where it's got us. No, she said again, this time softly. The money don't go there. She'll give it away to Uncle Judah, who will give it to that preacher who says you don't need nothing because the world is going to end. She turned to her brother. Charlie, you and me can't think about that. We got to think about keeping this farm for when Papa comes back. We should take that money and bury it someplace so when we get free, we can come back here and have a little seed cash to start over with. Maybe she'll sell the farm. She can't, not so long as Papa's alive. But maybe... We don't know that now, do we? We got to believe he's coming back, or he's sending for us. I hope he don't send for us. We'll persuade him to stay, she said. She wanted for a minute to put her arm around his thin shoulders, but she held back. She didn't want him to think that she considered him less than the man he had so bravely sought to be. We're a good team, eh, Charlie? Ox or mule, he asked, grinning. A little of both, I reckon. They cleaned the cabin and swept out the splintery plank floor. They knew it was a rough and homely place compared to the farmhouses along the road and the ample mansions around the village green. But their father, the seventh son of a poor Connecticut Valley farmer, had bought the land and built the cabin with his own hands before their birth, promising every year to sell enough maple sugar or oats or potash to build a larger, proper house with a real barn attached instead of a shed which must be found through rain or blizzard. His sugar bush was scraggly and his oak crop barely enough to feed his growing family. There were stumps to burn a plenty as he cleared the land, but suddenly there was no need for potash in England and hardly any demand in Vermont. He borrowed heavily to buy himself three sheep and the bottom dropped out of the wool market the very year he had had enough wool to think of it as a cash crop. He was an unlucky man. Even his children sensed that, but he loved them and worked hard for them and they loved him fiercely in return. Pulling shut the door, which despite all Charles's efforts still did not close quite flush, they remembered the bear and wondered how they could keep the wild creatures from destroying the cabin in their absence. Finally, Charles suggested that they take all the wood left in the wood pile and stack it in front of the door. It took them close to an hour to accomplish the move, but sweating and breathing hard, they admired their fortress effect. That made it a little easier for them to go. Charlie rode bareback astride the plow horse, his brown heels dug into the horse's wide flanks. Liddy, leading the cow, followed close by. She carried a gunny sack, which held her other dress and night shift. Her outgrown boots were joined by the laces and slung over her shoulder. The long walk would be more easily done with her feet free and bare. There was no need to tie the calf. It danced around its mother's backside, bleeding constantly for her to stand still long enough for a meal. It was the end of May. The mud was drying in the deeply rutted roadway, but Liddy did not watch her feet. Birds were playing in and out of the tall trees on either side of the road, calling and singing in the pale lacy greens and rusts of the new growth and the deep green of the pines and firs. Here and there, wildflowers dared to dance in full summer dress, forgetting that any night might bring a killing frost. Liddy breathed in the sweet air. It's spring, she said. Charles nodded. Do you mind too much going to the mill, she asked. He shrugged. I don't rightly know. Don't seem too bad. Dusty, I reckon. Not much time to be lazy, eh? She laughed. You wouldn't know how to be lazy, Charlie. He smiled at the compliment. I'd rather be home. She sighed. We'll be back, Charlie. I promise. They were both quiet a moment, remembering their father saying almost the same words. Truly, she added. I'm sure of it. He smiled. Sure, he said. They were in sight now of Quaker Stevenson's farm. They could see him, his broad-brimmed, straight black hat surrounded by the black hats of his three grown sons. They had the oxen yoked to a sled, which was already half-loaded with stones, and were digging away at more stones buried in a newly cleared field. Their farmhouse, close to the road, had been added onto over the years. The outlines of the first salt box could be made out on the northern end, which melted on the backside into a larger frame Cape Cod, then an L that served as shed, storage, privy, and corridor to two barns, the larger one growing out of the smaller. They were rich for all their Quaker adherence to the simple life. Envy crept up like a noxious vine. Liddy snapped it off, but the roots were deep and beyond her reach. Before they called out, the farmer had seen them. He waved, took off his hat to wipe his head and face on the sleeve of his homespun shirt, replaced his hat, and made his way across the field to the road. I see my bull served thee well, he said, smiling. His face was broad and red, his hair curly and gray about his ears. Great caterpillar eyebrows crowned his kindly eyes. We come to thank you, Liddy began, thinking fast, wanting to be fair and honest, but at the same time wanting a large price for the calf that she knew in her heart was partly his. Thee brought these beasts five miles down the road for that? He asked, his woolly eyebrows high up on his forehead. Liddy blushed. The truth is, we're taking the horse and cow to Mr. Westcott in payment of debt, and we're obliged to sell off this pretty calf straight away. Our mothers put us out to work. Thee's leaving thy land? 
It's lead as well, she said, allowing just a tiny hint of sadness to creep into her voice. Charles here and I was waiting for our father to come back from the west, but thee's been alone all winter? Just thee two children? She could feel Charles stiffen beside her. We managed fine, she said. He took off his hat again and wiped his face and neck. I should have come to call on my neighbors, he said quietly. She sensed a weakness. You wouldn't be interested. No, surely not. You got a mighty hurt already. I'll give thee twenty dollars for the calf, he said quickly. No, twenty-five. I know the sire and he's of a good line, he smiled. Liddy pretended to think. Seems mighty high, she said. She's half yours by rights, Charles blurted out before Liddy could elbow him quiet. His honesty would be her death yet. But the kind man persisted. It's a fair price for a nice fat little heifer. These kept her well. He invited them in to complete their business transaction, and before they were done, they found themselves eating a hearty noon dinner with the family. The room they sat down in was larger than the whole cabin with the shed thrown in. It was kitchen and parlor with a corner for spinning and weaving. The Quakers were rich enough to own their own loom. The meal spread out on the long oak table looked like a king's feast to children who, until the cow freshened, had lived mostly on rabbit and bark soup and the last of the moldy potatoes from the year before. The Quaker's wife was as large and red-faced as her husband and equally kind. She urged them to eat, for they still had a long walk ahead of them. This reminded Quaker Stevens that he needed nails. One of the boys could take them to the mill and then on to the village, he said. The cow and horse must be tethered to the back of the wet again so it would be nearly as slow as walking until they got to westcott's but if they'd care for the ride the sons had removed their hats for the meal they looked much younger and less stern than she remembered them the youngest luke she had seen more often back in the days when she had gone to school he had been one of the enormous boys who sat in the back of the schoolroom 16 or so when she was a tiny one in the front row she hadn't gone to school at all since her father left she hadn't dared to leave the babies alone with their mother charles had gone for most of the four months term up until this past winter until it had seemed too hard she hoped the miller would let him do some schooling he had a good mind not so stubborn against learning as hers seemed to be luke stevens tied the horse and cow to the back of the wagon and then came around to give lydia a hand up but she pretended not to see she couldn't have the man thinking she was a child or a helpless female she jumped up the high step into the wagon and then realized she'd be squeezed between luke and charles on the narrow seat she sat as tightly into herself as she could she wasn't used to brushing bodies with near strangers they hardly touched one another in the family it made her feel small and tongue-tied to be so close to this great hulk of a man he wasn't much of a talker either he leaned forward from time to time and talked around her to charles he asked if charlie knew much about the mill where he'd be working Charles's sweet, high-pitched, boyish tones made him seem heartbreakingly young against the deep male voice of his questioner. It was so unfair. This man had both father and mother and older brothers to live with and to care for him, while little Charlie must make his way in the world alone. She felt around the bottom of the gunny sack until her fingers found the lump of coinage. She pinched the money hard to remind herself not to cry. Then the farm will just lie fallow? Luke was asking Charles. No, it's let. The fields and pasture and sugar bush for the debt. The house and shed will just leave be. I hope the snow don't do in the roofs. Charles's anxious concern was almost too much for Liddy to bear. Oh, they'll be all right, and we'll be back in a couple of years. I could stop by. Would thee like me to stop by? Shovel the snow off the roof if need be? No need, she started, but Charles was already thanking him for his kindness. I'd be obliged, he said. It would take the worry off. Liddy and me aim to keep it standing against Papa's return. Don't make it trouble for yourself, though. It'd be no trouble, Luke said kindly. Ain't nobody to pack down the track come snow. He ignored her grumpy tone, smiling at her. I can snowshoe it. Nothing better than a good hike on my own. That house gets mighty crowded come winter. The way he spoke made Liddy feel that she was the child and Charles the responsible one. The horse and cow were safely delivered to Mr. Westcott. His farm lay in the river plain and was already alive with shoots of new corn. Liddy watched Mr. Westcott lead their old cow and horse away. Next to Westcott's sleek stock, they looked like hungry sparrows pecking in a hen yard. At a livelier clip, they took the river road toward Baker's Mill. I can walk from here easy, Charles protested, but Luke shook him off. Faster I get home, sooner I'm hauling rocks, he said, laughing. She didn't want Luke Stevens watching while she bid Charles goodbye, but again, maybe it was better. She might weaken if they were alone, and that would never do. I'll only be in the village, she said. Maybe you can drop up. Charles put his little hand on her arm. You mustn't worry, eh, Liddy, he said. You'll be all right. She nearly laughed. He was trying to comfort her, or maybe she nearly cried. She watched the gaping mouth of the mill swallow up his small form. He turned in the immense doorway. It was large enough to drive a high wagon through and waved. Let's be going, she said. It's late.
Luke nodded his head with a dip of his funny black hat. This here's Cutler's Tavern, he said. They hadn't spoken since they left the mill. Shall I come to the door with thee? The wagon had stopped before a low stone wall hung with a rail gate. She was horrified. No, no need, she said. They might not understand me riding up with a... She scrambled to the ground. He grinned. I hope to see thee before too much time is up, he said. Meantime, I'll see to thy house. He leaned over the seat. I'll give a look in on thy Charlie, too, he said. He's a good boy. She didn't know whether to be pleased or annoyed, but he clicked his tongue and the wagon pulled away, leaving her alone in her new life. Chapter 3, Cutler's Tavern Liddy stood outside the gate, waiting until Luke and his wagon disappeared around the curve of the road. Then she watched a pair of swallows dive and soar around the huge chimney in the center of the main house. The tavern was larger than the Stevenson's farmhouse. Addition after addition, porch, shed, and a couple of barns, the end one at least four stories high. The whole complex, recently painted with a mix of red ochre and buttermilk, stood against the sky with a row of giant beets popped clear of the earth. The pastures, a lush new green, were dotted with merino sheep and fat milk cows. There was a huge sugar maple in front of what must be the parlor door and another at the porch, which, from the presence of churns and cooling pans, must lead into the kitchen. Once I walk in that gate, I ain't free anymore, she thought. No matter how handsome the house, once I enter, I'm a servant girl, no more than a black slave. She had been queen of the cabin and the straggly fields and sugar bush up there on the hill, but now someone else would call the tune. How could her mother have done such a thing? She was sure her father would be horrified. She and Charlie drudges on someone else's place. It didn't matter that plenty of poor people put out their children for hire to save having to feed them. She and Charlie could have fed themselves, just one good heart harvest, one good sugaring, that was all they needed, and they could have stayed together. She was startled out of her dreaming by a hideous roar, and before she could figure out what animal could have made such a noise, a stagecoach appeared, drawn by two spans of sweating Morgan horses, shaking their great heads, showing their fierce teeth, saliva foaming on their iron bits. The coach had rounded the curve, its horn bellowing. The driver was yelling as well, and then, just in time, she realized that he was yelling at her. She jumped hard against the wall. He was still yelling back at her as he pulled up the reins, the coach itself now in the very spot where she had been standing seconds before. Should she apologize? No, he wasn't paying her any attention now. He was turning the team over to a boy who had run out of the shed. A woman was hurrying out of the kitchen door to welcome the passengers, who were climbing stiffly from the coach. Liddy stared. They were very grand looking. One of the gentlemen, a man in a beaver hat and frilled shirt, turned to hand a woman down the coach step. The lady's face was hidden by a fancy straw bonnet, the brim decorated with roses that matched her gown. Was it silk? Liddy couldn't be sure, never having seen a real silk dress before, but it was smooth and pink like a baby's cheek. Around her shoulders, the lady wore a shawl woven in a deeper shade of pink. Liddy marveled that the woman would wear something so delicate for a ride to the Northland in a dusty coach. Safely on the ground, the woman lifted her head and looked about her. Her face was thin and white, her features elegant. She caught Liddy's eyes and smiled. It was a very nice smile, not at all haughty. Liddy realized that she had been staring. She closed her mouth and quickly looked away. Then the encounter was over, for the stout woman who had come out of the kitchen door was hustling the lady, her escort, and two other passengers through the low gate and around to the main door at the north end of the tavern. Suddenly, she saw Liddy. She came over to the wall and whispered hoarsely across it to her. "'What are you doing here?' She was looking Liddy up and down as she asked, as though Liddy were a stray dog who had wandered too close to her house. Liddy was aware, as she might not have been minutes before, that she had no bonnet, and that her hair and braids were dusty from the road. She crossed her arms, trying to cover her worn brown homespun with the gunny sack. The dress was tight across her newly budding chest, and it hung unevenly to just above her ankles in a ragged hem. Her brown feet were bare, her outgrown boots still slung over her shoulder. She should have remembered to put them on before she got off Luke's wagon. Self-consciously, she raised her sleeve and wiped her nose and mouth under the woman's unforgiving stare. Go along, the woman was saying. This is a respectable tavern, not the township poor farm. Liddy could feel the rage oozing up like sap on a March morning. She cleared her throat and stood up straight. I'm Lydia Worthen, she said. I got a letter from my mother. The woman looked horrified. You're the new girl? I reckon I am, Liddy said, clutching her gunny sack more tightly. 
Well, I've no time to bother with you now, the woman said. Go into the kitchen and ask Trifina to tell you where you can wash. We keep a clean place here. Liddy bit her lip to keep from answering back. She looked straight into the woman's face until the woman blinked and turned, running a little to catch up with the guests who were waiting for her at the main door. The cook was as busy as the mistress and not eager to involve herself with a dirty new servant just when she was putting the meal on the table. Sit over there, Trifina shook her head at a low stool near the huge fireplace. Liddy would rather have stood after the long, bumpy ride in the Stevenson's wagon, but she chose not to cause a problem with the cook as well as with the mistress in the first ten minutes of her employment. The kitchen was three times the size of the whole Worthen cabin. Its center was the huge fireplace. Liddy could have stretched out full length in front of it, and her head and toes would have remained on the hearth with room to spare. Built into the right side of the brick chimney was a huge beehive-shaped oven, and the smell of fresh-baked loaves made Liddy forget the generous dinner she'd shared noontime. The trouble with eating good, she thought later, is you get too used to it. You think you ought to have it regular, not just for a treat. Over the fire hung a kettle so large that both the babies could have bathed in it together. It was bubbling with a meat stew chock full of carrots and onions and beans and potatoes and a thick brown broth. There were chickens turning on a spit, which seemed to be magically going round and round on its own. But as Liddy's eyes followed a leather strap upward, she saw above the fireplace the mechanism from which hung a huge metal pendulum. She wished, wished her father could see it. He could make one perhaps from wood, and then no one would have to tediously turn the spit by hand, but perhaps it was something you'd have to order from the blacksmith, in which case it was likely to be so dear that only the rich could afford one. She couldn't remember seeing one at the Stevenson's, and they were rich enough to own their own loom. Move, the cook said. The large woman was beginning to take the food from the fire. She gave Liddy a quick glance. Lucky you're so plain. Guests couldn't leave the last girl be. She was ladling stew into a large serving basin. Won't have no trouble with you, will we? Liddy picked up the stool and moved to a corner of the room. She knew she was no beauty, never had been, but she was a fierce worker. She'd prove that to the woman, should she offer to help now. But the cook was too busy moving the food from the fire to the long wooden table in the center of the room to pay her any mind. Liddy scrunched her body into itself and tucked her bare feet under the low stool, fearful of seeming in the way. Would all the guests come in here to eat? And if so, where should she hide? As if to answer her question, the mistress pushed through the door with a boy behind her. Hurry, she said. She supervised while the last of the food was transferred from the iron kettles into great china basins, which the cook and the boy carried from the kitchen to some other part of the house. The mistress mumbled and grumped orders, and in between complained of the guest who made herself out to be a lady when she was nothing but a factory girl putting on fancy airs. If the mistress saw Liddy sitting in the corner, she never let on. Liddy was glad to be ignored. She needed time and a chance to wash and change her dusty clothes. If only she hadn't worn her better homespun to travel in. The one in the gunny sack was even tighter and more ragged. She hadn't had a new dress since they sold the sheep four years ago. Since then, her body had begun to make those ch strange changes to womanhood that exasperated her. Why couldn't she be as thin and straight as a boy? Why couldn't she have been a boy? Perhaps then her father would not have had to leave. With an older son to help, maybe he could have made a living for them on the hill farm. But hard as she wished, hard as she tried, she was only a girl. She was, as girls go, scrawny and muscular, yet her boyish frame had in the last year betrayed her. Her breasts were small and her hips only slightly curved, but she couldn't help resenting these visible signs that she was doomed to be a female. Even the last year before Papa left, he had begun sending her in to help her mother. She never really got over the baby's birth, he'd say, but once there was no more wool to spin, she felt as though her presence in the house just made her mother try less. One by one, the household task had been turned over to Liddy, cooking and churning and cleaning and caring for the babies. For a while, her mother spun the flax. They had no loom and paid the village weaver and spun flax for cloth. Her father had left them in a new shirt her mother had made. But that was the last garment her mother sewed. Liddy tried to keep up the spinning, but when she had to take her father's place outdoors, she was too exhausted to try to spin and sew in the dim candlelight. Last winter, she sewed one shirt. She had made it for Charlie because he too was outgrowing his clothes, and the old wool shirt their father had left behind hung on him like a nightdress. As it turned out, Mistress Cutler provided her with a store-bought calico gown. It was softer than her rough brown homespun and fit her much better, but somehow it suited her less. How could she enjoy the garment of her servitude? She was fit with new boots as well. They pinched her feet and made her long to go barefoot, but she wore them, if not meekly, at least with determined obedience. After a few weeks and many blisters, they softened a little, and she was able to forget them for an hour or so at a time. 
The people at Cutler's were not so easy to forget. The mistress was large in body and seemed to be everywhere on watch. How could a woman, so obviously rich in this world's goods, be so mean in the use of them? Her eyes were narrow and close and always on the sharp for the least bit of spilt flour or the old, odd crumb on the lip. Not that Liddy would stoop to steal a bite of bread, but the boy, Willie Hyde, was given to snatching the last of the loaf as he carried the bread basket from the table to the kitchen. He was a year or so older than Charles and growing like red bird and to hear the mistress carry on about as useless. He was sent to shed or barn or field whenever he was not needed in the tavern itself. Liddy would not have said so, but she envied him the chance to be outdoors and out of boots so often. Mistress Cutler watched Liddy like a barn cat on a sparrow, but Liddy was determined not to give her cause for complaint. She had worked hard since she could remember, but now she worked even harder for who was there to share a moment's leisure with. Who would listen with her to a bird call, stare at the sunset, or watch a calf stumble on its long, funny legs toward its mother? Missing Charlie was like wearing a stone around her neck. She slept under the eaves in a windowless passage, which was hot and airless even in late spring. She was ordered to bed late and obliged to rise early, for the mistress was determined that no paying guests in the windowed rooms across the narrow passageway should know that they shared the floor with the kitchen girl. She spoke rarely, but she listened intently, storing up stories for Charlie. She didn't consider writing him. She was ashamed to have Charlie see her poor penmanship and crude spelling, and besides, there was no money for paper or postage, nothing except the calf money, and she would not spend a half penny of that. Indeed, at night, when she was too tired or too hot to sleep, she would take the gunny sack out from under her straw mattress and count the money in the darkness. It's like little Agnes sucking her thumb. She scolded herself, but she didn't stop. It was the only comfort she had that summer. It was nearly September when she saw the pink silk lady again. She had come this time on the coach from Burlington and was headed, Liddy overheard her say at supper, for Lowell, Massachusetts. When another traveler asked her business in Lowell, she smiled and said, why, I work in the Hamilton Mill there. Yes, she added, answering her question or stare. I'm one of those factory girls. The man murmured something and turned his face toward his bowl of stew. The lady watched him, still smiling, and then, catching Liddy's eye, smiled even more broadly as though to imply that Liddy was a comrade in some peculiar way. Indeed, when the men had left the dining room to go into the tap room, she stayed behind, reading a book she had taken from a small silk purse that matched her lovely dress. I've seen you before, haven't I? Liddy looked around to see to whom the lady was speaking, then realized the room was empty except for the two of them. In late May, when I was headed home to the farm for the summer, Liddy cleared her throat. She had lost the habit of conversation. She nodded. You're not one of the family here. Liddy shook her head. You're a good worker. I can see that. Liddy nodded again to acknowledge the compliment and turned again to loading the dirty dishes on her tray. You'd do well in the mill, you know. You'd clear at least two dollars a week. And, she paused, you'd be independent. She was lying. Liddy was sure of it. No girl could make that much money in a week's time. It's hard work, but maybe easier than what you do here, and you'd have some time to yourself to study or just rest. My mother's promised me here, Liddy said quickly, because the door from the kitchen was moving and suddenly Mistress Cutler was in the dining room. The woman looked from the lady to Liddy, opening her mouth to speak, but Liddy didn't wait. She hurried past her into the kitchen. That night, again, she counted the calf money. The lady had been lying, of course, but still, how had a farmer's daughter bought a silk dress?